No. Um, now I, I can see this a machine learning seminar. So I, I mean, I, I won't be talking about machine learning. I will be talking about um, persistent homology and uh, how, how we can uh, use it for comparing different data sets, um, in particular, how to compare different shapes. And uh, so in this talk, uh, um, I don't know how familiar people are about uh, um, topological data analysis and persistent homology. So I will start uh, reviewing a very common construction known as the Vietor filtration. And I will also review how to compute uh, persistent homology from it. And then I will talk a bit about um, morphisms between Vietor eclipse filtrations, which will be our motivating example. And uh, I will motivate further why um, um, we use, uh, uh, in particular, partial matchings and block functions to compare um, persistent homology uh, diagrams. And uh, I will talk about the barrel lesnik matching, which is a, a very popular uh, part, particular case of partial matching. And, and then I will give uh, some introduction to the block function, and we will see a few examples. So um, first of all, uh, let's have a look at the Vietor filtration. So one usually starts with a, a finite point sample in the Euclidean space. And uh, the Vietor Rips complex, it's uh, the maximal simplicial complex with edges on, on this point cloud. So, um, well, essentially a simplicial complex is, is like a graph, but with a higher dimensional um, um, polytopes attached to it. So uh, essentially what, what I mean by this is um, we have uh, this structure where we have the points and uh, between any pair of points, we add an edge um, uh, whenever their distance is smaller or equal than two times a uh, particular radius that we pick up. And uh, if we have uh, three points and uh, all of them are connected, like in this picture, there are like three points and all of them are connected, we have a triangle. And uh, the same for higher combinations of points. So if we have four points and all of them are connected, then we add um, a tetrahedron and, and so on. And uh, given a sequence of real numbers, uh, we obtain the uh, Vietor strips filtrations at the different values, and we have a sequence of inclusions between these. And we can visualize it, for example. For example, here we have uh, different stages with inclusions. And one might think of this a bit more abstractly um, as a category of real numbers where the objects are the real numbers and uh, we have an arrow between any pair of numbers whenever one is smaller or equal than the other. And uh, um, a way of thinking about this Vietorius complex is as um, uh, what is called a functor from this category to the category of simplicial complexes. Um, now, how do we compute um, persistent homology and in particular the barcodes? Well, um, the Vietorius filtration uh, grows a lot because uh, even if we just pick up 200 points, if we consider all the possible connections between them, I will get something very big. So one usually picks up a maximum radius and then consider the Vietorius Rips complex at that radius. And for each simplex, we have uh, its corresponding filtration which is uh, the maximum distance between any pair of vertices divided by two. And uh, we, we also bound the Vietor strips uh, complex by um, a dimension. So we, we pick up some positive integer and uh, we consider what is called the disk skeleton, which is given by all um, simplices um, bounded uh, by this dimension. So for example, if we pick up D to be two, we will be only considering the, the vertices, edges, and then triangles, which we don't consider high dimensional um, polytopes. Um, now, once we have this um, bounded, this skeleton, uh, we may order the simplices um, by increasing filtration values and dimension um, so that um, 
one simplex is smaller or equal than another whenever the um, filtrations are also smaller or equal and the same with the dimensions. And the next step is to pick up a field, um, for example, Z11. And we compute um, um, what is called the boundary matrix of this uh, bounded this skeleton. And from that, we can uh, obtain the persistent barcodes and representatives. So here is a very simple example. We have four uh, vertices together with um, edges between them and uh, two triangles. And, uh, and we, we can obtain the boundary matrix, which is a very sparse matrix. And uh, the, the way of obtaining the coefficients is, uh, for example, uh, uh, look at this uh, edge uh, E0. We can orient it as if we are going from the vertex 0 to the vertex 1. And then we, we will put uh, 1 uh, for V1 and the minus 1 for V0. So each, each column will be the boundary of each one of these edges. And then we have something similar for, for these triangles. Now, this, this matrix is, of course, if we have a few points and, and we take a, a big uh, maximum radius and uh, maximum dimensions, this, these matrices can grow a lot. Um, um, but, well, yeah, that's up to the computations. So the, um, the next step in the procedure is computing the Gaussian reduction of this matrix, um, so the column reduction, and the lookup at the pivots. Uh, and this, these pivots always um, pair uh, rows with columns where the row is um, a simplex that has one dimension less than the one in the column. So for example, vertices are paired with edges and edges are paired with uh, simplices, well, uh, two with, with triangles. And uh, well, basically doing this Gaussian reduction, we get what are called the persistent pairs. And uh, usually the, the first element is known as the positive simplex and the second one is known as the negative simplex. And um, um, so for each pair, we can obtain an interval, which uh, in the case of the heterotrophic fil filtrations, um, these intervals are always closed on the left and open on the right. And uh, these intervals go from the filtration value of um, the positive simplex to the filtration value of the negative simplex. And of course, this, these intervals are non-trivial only if um, the, the extremes are one strictly less than the other. And uh, by convention, the first value is, uh, is known as the birth value, and the, the death value is, well, the, the uh, filtration of the negative simplex is known as the death value, the interval. And, and we can plot these intervals uh, for this example, uh, where we have a few points and consider the Vietor trips complex, and we obtain this, this barcode. Um, now, these first bars are, um, uh, correspond to positive simplices of dimension zero, two vertices. And uh, what is going on here is we, um, we track the connectivity of, um, of this. Uh, with filtration as, as we increase the radius. So we start with a few points um, and, uh, and we keep losing points and that's why some of the bars die. And eventually we only have one bar and this is due that there's one vertex that it, it's not paired with any edge. And, and that's because there's, there's always at the end one connected component. And therefore uh, um, the one dimensional uh, intervals we will only get two non-trivial intervals in this example, which correspond to these um, cycles that we can see in this picture. Now, what we are really doing here is uh, compute homology uh, with uh, respect to the field that we pick up. And uh, well, zero-dimensional homology tracks connected components, um, one-dimensional homology tracks holes, and, and one has even higher dimensional um, um, homology groups. And uh, because we are composing this homology with this Vietor group filtration, what we actually get is uh, what is known as a persistent homology that 
can be thought as a phantom from um, these real numbers as opposed to uh, the category of vector spaces over the field that we pick up. So we can think of it um, looking at these barcodes as um, vector spaces over the different uh, values. And uh, this, the dimension of these vector spaces depends on how many bars we have. So for dimension zero, we start with 21 bars, but for example, here we only have one bar. And uh, over here, we don't have any bars, and then suddenly we have one, we have two, and, and we also get linear maps between them. So any questions so far? Okay, then I will continue. Uh, so this, this leads to a little bit more abstract uh, definition, which is, um, so we, we have this persistent homology, which is a functor from uh, real numbers to vector spaces, and one can think of, of this algebraic structure and is known as a persistent module. And uh, it's, it's sometimes written as a pair, um, V rho. Um, and, and the way of thinking about this is, well, we have a vector space for each real number. And for any pair of real numbers, one smaller than the other, we have a linear map. And, uh, and we also have morphisms between these persistent modules. Uh, and these are uh, sets of uh, linear maps between, so given two persistent modules, we, we get a, a set of linear maps between their respective components for each uh, real number. And the, the rule is that um, these linear maps commute with the structure maps that we had before. And there are alternative names for, for this, uh, um, instead of saying amorphism, between persistent module, sometimes uh, people say a persistent morphism or a ladder module. And uh, th there's a very uh, simple in, um, persistent module known as the interval module that uh, we will see a lot during this talk. And, and this, is, this is essentially a copy of the field along an interval and zero everywhere else. And between any two copies of the field, we, we just have uh, the identity. Well, so why, why are these interval modules uh, important? Well, um, given any persistent module, there's a, a very general condition known as the descending chain conditions for images and kernels that ensures that um, uh, a persistent module is isomorphic to a direct sum of interval modules. Um, and that's why um, we understand completely a persistent module by its interval decomposition. So for example, we understand persistent homology by its decomposition by internals that I just showed from the previous example. And, uh, and uh, this leads to the definition of a barcode for a, a persistent module. And this is a multiset of uh, intervals together with a multiplicity for each interval, um, which is is just a function telling us um, how many copies of an interval we have. And once we have a multiset, um, we may think of its elements in terms of our representation, which is a set of pairs where uh, the first element is, uh, there will be the intervals and then the second one will be the index of um, our copy of, of an interval. So here is uh, a very, Simple example, we consider a persistent module, which is given by this sum of um, two interval modules of the interval one, two, and the interval two, three. Now its, it's barcode will be um, uh, essentially two intervals, so one, two, and two, three. And the interval one, two has multiplicity two, and this other one has multiplicity one. And its representation can be written as, as this. So instead of pairs, we, we can keep the index as, as a subindex on the right uh, because it's, it's uh, easier to, to visualize. And, and we can also draw the representation as, as a diagram like this. Um, okay, so let's now move on to um, persistent morphisms, or why we are interested in them. So um, the first thing is, okay, we have a morphism between persistent modules. Um, um, 
uh, we would like to have something that uh, helps us to understand these morphisms. Now, when we just have a persistent module, we have the barcode that characterizes it. But unfortunately, when one has a morphism, um, uh, the inner composables are, are of uh, wild type. And then we don't have something like a barcode for them. But uh, one might still use the fact that, well, um, I know there's a barcode for B, and there's also a barcode for U, so why we don't use that? Um, and so what one might do is uh, uh, take what is uh, known as a barcode basis for each uh, term, for the domain and the codomain. And that's a particular choice of an isomorphism between the persistent module and a direct sum of interval modules. And uh, given such a choice for the domain and codomain, we also have um, an associated matrix. So very much like in linear algebra, when you have a linear map, um, you may choose a, a basis for the domain and codomain, and then you get an associated matrix. So here is the same thing is, is going on. Um, and here is the, the example that we will consider on this talk. So we have um, a pair of finite subsets. And uh, we may assume that the uh, X is a subset of Y. And this, this induces an, an inclusion of the groups complexes, um, which in turn uh, induces a, a morphism between their persistent homologies. So we would like to, un to understand uh, this, this morphism um, first by, by getting this associated matrix. So, so here, I. I can explain how to obtain this matrix, but this is, this is a little bit technical. So are people interested in knowing how to compute this um, associated matrix? So, um, well, otherwise I will just skip this and leave it for questions. Okay, then um, you, you, can, you can believe there's an associated matrix and if, if later you're interested, we can go through it. Right, so here is, um, an example where we have a couple of point clouds and the top one is included in the bottom one. And if we compute the one dimensional barcodes, we get this and this. Now uh, the small bars are not very important so we can just ignore them. And uh, uh, we may understand uh, the inclusion by um, these uh, barcodes together with this associated matrix. Now, this matrix, um, it's not canonical. So one, the, um, so these bars that we get in the domain and codomain, they don't change um, if we change their um, cycle representatives. Well, these matrices may change. However, um, I will show in this talk that these matrices are actually very useful to, to get um, indicators of how these bars and these bars um, relate to one another and, and how these two persistent modules uh, relate them. Intuitively in this example, we have that um, the bar alpha two is associated to this uh, cycle and it goes to this, these two bars uh, which intuitively, well, we see that the, this cycle here is the sum of these two cycles. So there's, and this, the way one gets these matrices is, is very geometrical. Um, well, so for example, given an associated matrix, one can compute the, um, the barcode for the image um, of a persistent morphism. And the way to do it is, is like this. So first, um, well, first compute the barcodes of, uh, of V and U, and then, sort the bars from uh, V by following the standard order. So what does that mean? Two intervals, one is smaller or equal than the other. If the start point one is strictly less than the other, or if the two start points are the same, then um, longer bars go first. So the bars with um, the bigger uh, death value go first. And that's the standard order. And that's how we order. Um, the columns of the associated matrix. And now the rows, uh, so the, the intervals from U, uh, we, we order them following the endpoint order. So essentially two intervals, one 
is smaller or equal than the other when um, the endpoints are strictly one less than the other, or um, if the start points are less or equal than the other. And uh, we consider um, uh, the associated matrix with this ordering. And all we have to do is just compute a Gaussian elimination of such a matrix. And the columns generate uh, the image. And the, the barcode from the image is, is obtained in this way. So um, if we have a column associated to an interval and a row associated to another, um, the bar will have the birth value from the, which is the birth value of the column and the death value of the row. And one can do very similar things to compute kernels and quotients. Um, so the kernel of, of amorphism or the quotient of the image of amorphism, um, things like that. And well, if, if you are interested in that algebraic uh, work, uh, you can check my thesis. So here is a, um, a little example where we have a pair of barcodes, one for V and another for U. And this is the associated matrix. Um, we've ordered the bars um, in V following the standard order, in U following the endpoint order. And if one reduces this matrix, um, one gets a barcode for the image. And this is something that you can check. Um, well, so um, the barcodes for the image and the kernel are very, um, give us an intuition of how um, we can understand that. Um, two persistent modules with amorphism between them relate. Um, but this, this um, um, well, these images and kernels might miss uh, some, some important features of our data. Um, here is a, a simple example. So we consider um, a point cloud X with these red points. And uh, if we compute its persistent diagram, um, we get this. Now, uh, here it's, it's the same as the barcode. Uh, what I'm doing here is um, instead of drawing bars, uh, we have a point for each bar where we are, um, um, the, the X coordinate will be the birth value of the bar and the Y coordinate will be the death value. So that's why all points lie over the diagonal. And the idea is that um, the more far away the point is from the diagonal, the longer the bar is. Uh, so these red points here will be the zero dimensional bars. And uh, in one dimension, we get two points that are very close. And that's, this is only for these red points here. And if we see in the picture, both circles are very similar. So it's not surprising that both points lie close to one another. Now, um, consider y to be the same points from x plus these points that we have around here in blue. Then we, we still have two points in dimension one. Well, we also have a few more, but these are small bars. So they are not very relevant. But we have two very distinguished bars. Um, but they are not close anymore. They are like shifted. And uh, well, um, in the picture, we, we still see that um, this circle is, is, uh, is uh, on top of, of this other circle. So there, there should be some relations between uh, these points. However, if we compute the image and kernel, in the image, we still have two bars, but one of them um, is a lot smaller. And uh, the kernel actually is, is very big. So one might deduce from, from these diagrams that um, um, X has two circles, but um, one of them is lost on the way when um, including this point cloud into Y. But uh, intuitively, this, this shouldn't be the case because um, this circle is still there in a way. So um, one might try to compute the uh, metrics between the diagrams, so um, comparing the points from this diagram to that one. And um, for example, uh, there's this um, metric known as a bottleneck matching and it, it wouldn't work either. One will just match the points to the diagonal. But uh, in this talk, I will, um, I will, mod well, I, I will explain uh, 
a way of relating the bars that will capture the fact that um, these red points are on top of these blue points. And, and this is interesting because one might want to capture the, the topology of this bigger data set, for example, by taking a, a sample. And the one can get it through um, induced block functions. So any questions so far? Uh, yes, Alvaro, yes. I have a, an eighth question. Is there any yeah. uh, deep reason why someone should use a uh, barcodes rather than persistent diagrams? Or is it just a matter of, I prefer um, to... Oh, uh, you mean this uh, representation? Yeah, using barcodes bar rather than, yes. Uh, well, the only reason I can think of is uh, with barcodes. So, okay, in this example, all our bars, all our intervals um, are, so, okay, here the bars go from below to the top. So they are left closed, well, in this case, bottom closed and um, top uh, open. So you may use barcodes to know when your intervals are open or closed, um, if you are interested in that, but otherwise uh, um, they are pretty much, as far as I know, um, they are pretty, like you, you can get a barcode from the persistent diagram and the other way around. Okay. In fact, uh, um, most people just use the diagram because it's, it's much more compact and easier to understand. Um, Oh, okay. there's another reason is uh, with barcodes, you can see more easily the copies of an interval. With um, persistent diagrams, you might have to start writing, um, I don't know, labels saying, oh, I have this point with uh, yeah. multiplicity five. Uh, yes, so multiplicity. It's, uh, it's a matter of taste. Um, I like having both of them. <laughs> because, <laughs> okay. Uh, what you're doing, it's better at one or the other. Thank okay, you. so so yeah, hopefully I've kind of convinced you that um, it's um, important to get um, uh, tools that uh, let us know relations between persistent diagrams in, in such a fashion. And um, well, so I will explain first what is a block function and what is a partial matching, and then we will jump into some examples. So um, a block function, uh, so we have uh, two barcodes and it's uh, basically a function from the product of uh, the sets of intervals to um, some positive, in inter well, uh, positive integers. And uh, such that um, if we fix an interval on the second component and we add up over the intervals on the first component, um, oh, the other way around. We, we fix the, the interval on the first uh, component and vary over the other and add up. This uh, bound is uh, satisfied. So um, we, we never go over the multiplicity of, of an interval in, in the domain. Um, and uh, we may think of, of these uh, functions as an assignment between um, subsets of the representations of uh, both barcodes. So very soon I will show examples of this. Um, and this is why sometimes we might just write it as, as a function between the representations. And um, then a partial matching will actually um, be a, a bijection between such subsets. And uh, we, we always get a partial matching uh, whenever a block function, apart from satisfying this condition, also satisfies the bound um, by fixing the second component and adding up over the first component. So here is an example where we have uh, two barcodes, um, which they are depicted here on the bottom. Um, and uh, well, we consider um, the assignment from the product to the positive integers, which is zero for all pairs, except for um, this pair, it's equal to one and this other pair is equal to two. And this is a block function because um, uh, yeah, um, the multiplicity of uh, two, four is one and, uh, 
and this uh, one, one, one can check this, this bounds and indeed they are satisfied. And what these bounds actually tell us is um, we can send these bars, um, two bars there, but we, we don't send, for example, one bar to two bars. We only send each one of the bars to another bar. Um, unfortunately, if we check the partial matching bound, it is not satisfied. So if we try to match um, the bars in the domain with the ones in the codomain using these numbers, so, so we, we send the bar to one, one five to two bars one four, as well as um, the bar two four to one of the one four bars, even if we go to the bottom one or the top one, we will always break the matching condition. We, we don't get one bar to another bar. Um, uh, now, if we consider the same example, but instead of having a two here, we have a one, um, we only are sending one of these two bars to another bar, and then we can match this bar to that one, and we have a matching between the bars. And uh, we can understand this as sending, okay, the bar, one of the bars two four to the bar one four and one of the bars one five to the bar one four. Um, now um, we we are considering the case where we have a persistent morphism and uh, there's a very um, famous partial matching that one can um, one can use in this situation and uh, it, it was introduced by uh, Bauer and Lesnick in 2015. And the, the way it works is, is very intuitive and uh, very simple. It's um, first you compute the barcode of, of the image of a function. And then all you have to do is match um, the bars in the domain um, by following the start points with bars in the image and bars in the codomain by following the endpoints with uh, uh, bars of the image. Now, it could happen that the two bars, they have the same endpoint and um, bars that we are matching. And um, in this case, we always match the longest bar with the longest bar and the shortest bar with the shortest bar. Um, now, the, there's a problem with this matching. Uh, it's, it's very intuitive um, because, uh, for example, we match this bar on the bottom with this bar and this other bar with the top bar. Um, but it, it might miss uh, to capture the structure of uh, the persistent module. So, for example, if you consider the persistent module that is given by um, the direct sum of uh, amorphism sending the interval 2, 3 to 0, and another one sending the interval 2, 2 to 1, 2, um, then, um, well, this, this morphism we can understand it as. Um, the persistent morphism going from uh, the direct sum of two intervals with this associated matrix. And uh, in this case, we one will expect that if we are matching the bars, um, the bar two, three should go to the empty set because it's going to zero. And the bar two, two should go to the bar one, two. However, um, because of this rule of sending longer bars to longer bars, um, what actually happens is we are sending the interval two, three to interval one, two, and also the interval two, two at the empty set. And there's, there's another difficulty with this approach of matching bars based on endpoints, is that uh, one, might have to check equality of double type variables. Now this depends on the implementation, but uh, as it is, uh, one will be doing that. And this is not a great idea in general. Um, um, now, um, so I'm, I'm going to introduce this uh, block function that uh, behaves a bit better. And uh, it's, it's essentially, um, well, I, I won't put the definition, but I will give you some of the properties so that um, you see how it works. Uh, it's a bit technical. All the details can be found in this article, but uh, it's that, because of that, I, I, I won't attempt to, to put the definition. 
but it has, um, for example, the additivity properties. So it will have a uh, um, direct sum of persistent uh, morphisms. Um, the block function of the sum is equal to the sum of block functions. And we also have, for example, a pivot property that uh, if we have, if our domain only has one bar, and this is the associated matrix, and the intervals in the codomain are given in endpoint order, then the matching is always given by the pivot. Um, well, going back to this example, because of additivity, we can discard the first uh, element that will not give us any matching. And because of the pivot property, we will be matching the interval two, two with the interval one, two. And in this case, we will get the matching that we are expecting. So two, three will go to zero as one is here and two, two will go to one, two. And th there's also an interval order condition that uh, um, this block function is only non-zero whenever um, um, the interval in, in the domain has uh, the start point is greater than the start point of the interval in the codomain and something similar for the input. Okay, so here is also one example of how this block function behaves in practice. So suppose uh, you have uh, the points marked in blue and, and then the total point cloud will be the sum of both. Um, then this will be the matching. And if we move uh, this point cloud around, we can still see the matching even though both points might be quite far away from one another. Um, and uh, yeah, so one, one can track these relations between um, the different subsets. Uh, so going back to associated matrices. Uh, so I, I'm not giving the definition of the block function, but I will explain you how to compute it in practice, which might be more useful if you want to play around with it. Um, so for example, uh, consider this persistent morphism with these intervals in the domain um, ordered. So now, now we, we order the intervals in the domain by the endpoint order as well, and the ones in the codomain by the endpoint order. Um, and so we get the associated matrix, uh, which in this case could be this one. And then what we do is for each column, we consider the minor given by um, the corresponding, uh, well, by the column plus all those columns labeled by intervals that are smaller or equal in the uh, birth value and death value. So for example, uh, two, three um, is the first column. We only get this. This will be the pivot. And then we, we match the interval two, three with the interval zero, three. Then for one, four, we get this pivot and we match um, one, four with the interval one, four. And for two, five, we consider all the previous columns because um, this, Two intervals are small or equal in both endpoints. And if we do Gaussian reduction, we just get zero. So we send the interval to five to the empty set. And uh, for example, revisiting this example, um, uh, the matching that we will do will be um, also following this um, pivot that we have here. Um, and this will be the illustration. Um, now, uh, for all these examples, it seems that I'm always getting a matching, but uh, uh, in general, this construction is a block function. And when when things get broken that we don't get a, a matching, well, that happens when we have nested intervals. So um, three intervals are nested whenever um, one is inside the other strictly. So for example, for two closed intervals, that will happen if, if we have this condition. And this is this result um, that we got uh, with Rocio Amanu, um, that uh, if we have a sum of intervals in the domain that is, is breaking this, this bound that we require for a block function to be a partial matching, then there's, there's always in this set of intervals, a pair of nested intervals. So for example, if, if you consider um, 
uh, in the domain uh, a persistent module which has no nested intervals, you always get a partial maximum. But that's that's a very um, uh, well, that's a very strong assumption. So in general, this is not the case. Uh, here is another example um, of we have a, a total set together with a couple of subsets. Um, and these are the respective associated intervals. Now, all of them are the same. And uh, uh, well, in practice, they weren't exactly the same. I, I just rounded out, and these were the numbers that came out. So if we are rounding to just first decimal place, we get the same intervals. Um, and uh, in this case, the, the bars in the domain and in the and in here, they are all the same. And uh, these are the associated matrices. And we can compute the image, as, as I explained earlier. Um, and for the domain, we, we will get the um, so, um, associated matrix. Now we are ordering the columns by the standard order, because we are computing the image. And we will get this uh, barcode with two bars. And, and we get the same barcode for the image for both subsets. So we cannot distinguish them using the image uh, barcode. However, um, using this block function, um, we get different things uh, because uh, in, uh, in this first example, uh, we will get this assignment where we send uh, this, this bar here to this bar, this other one to the same bar, because actually these two intervals are nested, um, and this other bar to the last bar. Well, um, for this other example, for the right-hand side uh, point cloud, um, when we do the matching, we, we miss out um, uh, the first bar in the column. And well, I will finish with, with a very simple example. So I, well, kind of use, use case example. I, I, I did this, uh, research in Sevilla, um, where it's a, well, touristically, it's a very important city, but it also has very good restaurants and, and people really like uh, going out to very nice bars and restaurants. And I, I wanted to check, okay, which uh, um, distribution is more relevant to one of the restaurants or, or the hotels. And well, a priori, um, one only gets 67 hotels and a bunch more restaurants. So Obviously, uh, restaurants are much more um, important uh, by, by looking at just the numbers. But if we take a sample of restaurants um, and then check uh, the, um, the block function from the hotels to the total and from the restaurants to the total. Now, this will be taking a sample of 67 restaurants to, to even the, the numbers. Um, we see that. Um, the block functions from the hotels to the restaurants only has uh, two matchings and there are no much more matchings, whereas there are many more matchings from, from the restaurants. Um, these are also matchings. These are like intervals that are just, just opposed one to the other. And actually, obviously, if we, if we increase the size of the restaurant, uh, this is even more, um, you, you can even see a lot more relations between the first and the round while the hotels just misses up. Um, there are no relations at all. Um, okay, so future work. Um, I'm, I'm currently working on trying to not only get a block function, but um, a partial matching that um, behaves well with respect to these direct sums. And it's something we can rely on when comparing, um, uh, well, when understanding persistent morphisms. Also, a very crucial part when, when doing these small experiments is that there are no, um, in the literature, there are no, well, and in the available software, there are no implementations for obtaining the associated matrix. So this is, um, this is something that it would be nice to have an optimal code for that. Um, also, it will be interesting to obtain um, block functions, not only between vector six complexes, but also other filter complexes, such as the alpha complex. And uh, also something interesting will be to find the 
stability condition for these assignments. Um, in principle, there are no stability guarantees. There are stability guarantees for the persistent diagrams, but for these assignments, um, it's something that needs to be done. Um, and obviously, like find use cases where, uh, for example, we want to compare two distributions and we use this uh, block function to, to quantify um, how um, these two distributions are related by tracking the, um, the underlying geometry of data. And uh, here are some of the, uh, of the work. This block function uh, was introduced in this article. And then, uh, yeah, so here is the decomposition and use matching and my thesis. And uh, these are the sponsors of all this work. And uh, thank you very much.